Kazakhstan Hospital for Roma Inclusion, and she's going also to present the Roma Health Network mission and vision. Please, Rados, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Danielle. Uh, first, I would like to say that I'm honored to welcome you to this event, marking the official launch of the Roma uh, Health Network. And uh, we'll start with, with a brief explanation about the reasons that motivated us to uh, join our forces and establish this uh, network. Um, the first point that I would like to raise is the set of the context um, causing health inequalities experienced by Roma communities across Europe. As you know, Roma are the largest ethnic minority in Europe, but also the most disadvantaged in terms of health, social and economic protection, which raises further challenges for Roma equality and inclusion. Evidence constantly demonstrates that the, the inequalities between Roma and non-Roma are growing and this is in correlation with social and economic conditions, but also systemic discrimination and lower human rights protection, pushing Roma at the margin of society. Can you move to the next slide, please? Roma are born, live and work in disadvantaged conditions responsible for their higher exposure to poor health. They have been pushed uh, at, the, at uh, the outskirts of uh, cities and villages in underdeveloped areas and isolated places where Roma have been facing ethnic discrimination and ethnic segregation for decades. This form of systemic discrimination deprives Roma of optimal conditions for maintaining good health status, both physical and mental. In Europe, which is one of the richest region in the world, Roma are disproportionately affected by substandard housing, including severe material deprivation and overcrowding. In addition to be ethnically segregated, Roma settlements often lack ba basic public services, such as water supply and sanitation, regular garbage collection, and safe connection to electricity power grids. As a result, Roma are more vulnerable to communicable disease, to epidemic outbreaks, but also to domestic accidents. The lack of decent living conditions increase their vulnerability to chronic and non-communicable diseases that require costly and long-term medical treatment, which is almost unaffordable for Roma communities who experience high poverty rates. Substandard so housing has devastating effects on child's health and its optimal growth. Children living in poor living conditions in overcrowded homes have less chances to develop their optimal potential in adulthood and suffer more often from chronic, from chronic disease. Climate change and its impact on living condition additionally aggravates the health of entire Roma communities, highly exposed to environmental discrimination in segregated areas. Next slide, please. Despite the existing legal frameworks guaranteeing the access to healthcare, the accessibility of availability and affordability of health and prevention services remains a daily struggle for Roma communities, for Roma adults and children. The Racial Equality Directive prohibits any racial and ethnic discrimination and promotes equal treatment in healthcare. Article 35 of the European Charter, European Union Charter of Fundamental Rights guarantees the right to preventive healthcare and medical treatment. The social pillar also promotes equal access to healthcare of good quality. However, the lack of health coverage and frequent out-of-pocket payments are major barriers for improving Roma health. Discriminate, discriminatory practices, including ethnic segregation in hospitals, clinics, and maternity wards, further deprive Roma of their, their right to accessing healthcare and prevention services of good quality. A survey conducted by the Fundamental Rights Agency 
demonstrate that in many member states, European countries, the number of Roma who do not have health coverage may reach 50%. And this has a great impact on their capacity to afford and to access healthcare and preventive services. In many European countries, health protection depends on employment benefits and social protection systems. Thus, many Roma who are not employed, who um, do not enjoy employment and social protection benefits, are left behind. Out-of-pocket payments exacerbate financial hardship for Roma families, who are four times more vulnerable to poverty than the majority. Out-of-pocket payments further prevent Roma to access healthcare and prevention services of good quality, to have a regular medical treatment and medical follow-up. And this is much more relevant for pregnant women, for specific socioeconomic groups, um, such as elderly, people with disabilities, but also for Roma who suffer from chronic and non-communicable disease, which requires costly and long time, um, long time medical treatment. Healthcare costs may drive people to make a choice between affording their medical treatment and covering basic needs such as accommodation and food. And this has a direct influence on individuals and communities' health. The results of this situation are alarm alarming. Roma have 15 years shorter life expectancy than the majority. And this is a strong indicator for population health and well-being. A recent survey produced by the Fundamental Rights Agency indicates that Roma, Roma women have almost 10 years shorter life expectancy than non-Roma women. In general, health status worsens with age. And given the fact that Roma are a relatively young population than the majority, the health inequalities are even more significant. This week, the European Commission launched a new policy framework for Roma equality and inclusion, and we welcome its commitment to improve Roma health by addressing and reducing the life expectancy gap. Nevertheless, this ambitious objective requires strong policy efforts in many areas going beyond the healthcare. Adopting and implementing integrated national strategies for Roma equality and inclusion and action plans addressing holistically the social determinants of health will contribute to achieve positive and sustainable results on Roma health and other social outcomes. Setting up national indicators and targets, enabling progress monitoring in access to health coverage, prevention of non-communicable disease, child obesity, women's health, elderly health, protection of people uh, with disabilities can make it possible to effectively tackle the life expectancy gap. Moreover, synergies between the European framework for Roma equality and inclusion and major EU policies such as the Green Deal, the European Child Guarantee, the Europe's Beating Cancer Plan offer further opportunities to increase health protection and prevention for Roma. Next slide, please. In light of constantly growing challenges for Roma health in EU member states and candidate countries, Roma and pro-Roma civil society organizations, experts, academics, and activists have decided to unite their forces and create the Roma Health Network. This is a public health community which seeks to improve Roma health by highlighting effective policy measures for reducing health inequalities from the first years of life. Looking beyond the health sector, the Roma Health Network encourages cooperation between a large variety of stakeholders for closing the gap in health. The network provides space for policy dialogue 
but also enhances research, monitoring and reporting that may contribute to better assessing, analyzing and addressing the needs and challenges faced by Roma communities in access to healthcare. To achieve this mission, the network advances the participation of Roma and pro-Roma civil society, activists and health professionals in policy makers, in policy making at all levels. And this is an essential factor for developing and implementing effective policies that will, will make it possible to achieve a positive change on Roma inclusion and equality. Public health strategies, actions and interventions developed and implemented in partnership and cooperation with Roma communities is a working model advanced by the Roma Health Network, which can be positively and successfully applied on other vulnerable groups to achieve sustainable results on societies and economies. Now, I would like to thank you for your attention and look forward to receiving your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rados, for this very interesting presentation. For sure, the Roma Health Network is a very promising initiative to tackle social inequalities in health. And to understand social inequalities in health, we should consider the social determinants of health. And one of the main determinants, for sure, is education. And because of that, we are going to introduce Nat, uh, now uh, Roland Ferkovic, who is a policy and advocacy officer at the Roma Education Fund. Um, he is going to introduce a contribution about investing in Roma education for reducing inequalities between and within countries. Uh, the Roma Education Fund is an international foundation uh, whose ultimate goal is to close the gap in educational outcomes between the Roma and the non-Roma. Policies and programs that ensure quality and inclusive education for Roma, including the very important point of the segregation of educational systems across Central, Eastern, Southeastern Europe and Turkey. Thank you, Roland. Roland, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Mm, I hope you can hear me well. Okay. Um, thank you very much for the opportunity to give a presentation uh, today for the launch of the of this of this network. Um, when I prepared my my presentation, I was trying to approach education and health and the relation between the two, as well as to, to talk a little bit about the pandemic effect on Roma education. Uh, the reason why I'm also adding the pandemic effect and the pandemia that I'm presenting now is that we just simply cannot miss it. Um, I would like to share with you the Roma Education Fund standpoint on these matters. Uh, may I ask you please the next slide? So, as it has been already mentioned, the mission is to close the educational gap uh, between Roma and non-Roma. And when it comes to health and education, there needs to be a so-called broader understanding of the issue and the broader understanding how education and health is related to each other. As well as another so-called standing point of the Roma Education Fund, when it comes to health and education, is the so-called health conditions and examinations that are so-called uh, prerequisites for, for successful enrollment in standard schools. Uh, next slide, please. Before I would jump into the relation between the two uh, policy area, I would like to very briefly present a little bit about what Rome Education Fund is doing in EU member states. Uh, the data that is being presented is uh, only in EU member states, although our foundation is also present in non-EU member states. So over the last decade, uh, more than 219 projects have been implemented, plus 10, 20 are uh, ongoing, and 17 projects are also part of our emergency fund and emergency action plan in regarding to the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, 
that there has been more than 130,000 children and youth who have participated in our projects. These projects were on different educational levels, both on ECD, primary school, the segregation and secondary school. Another aspect that is important, not only in terms of education, but also in terms of health, the parental involvement in our programs, which is more than 215,000 parents were involved. Uh, when it comes to so-called educational indicators, just a couple of them to be mentioned. For instance, the dropout rate were decreased uh, from 0 to 5 percent, where RAF were intervening. There is also quite a strong uh, improvement in the GPA, such as 5 to 10 percent, and around uh, 80 percent of the graduation rates is being presented when RAF is intervening. Uh, is the so-called uh, policy and and uh, and advocacy developments in various countries? Uh, I could bring here up Bulgaria as an EU member state, or North Macedonia as an EU member state, where we are basically uh, successfully managed our various kind of projects or programs to be part in the public policies. Next slide, please. Thank you. So why I was talking about this kind of uh, interventions of the Roma Education Fund. So what are the so-called contributions? How these are basically contributing to the social inclusion, but also to the economic inclusion of Romani minorities in Europe. The very first point is that due to or, or, or throughout our project interventions, we are positioning uh, Roma issues as such on, on, on political and policy agendas. Also, we are contributing to various levels of policy developments. Uh, on the other hand, when I'm taking the so-called health perspective of our interventions, there is a contribution to child health, brain and educational development. These are especially important when I'm talking about a health perspective when we are providing our ECD level interventions. We are also increasing the contact between Roma and non-Roma communities, as well as the so-called school stakeholders. Here I'm talking about also the school principals, the teachers, the kindergarten teachers, so on and so forth. Uh, when I'm talking about parents, I also need to point out that is an increase in parental awareness and also developing the parental skills as such. Additionally, that I wanted to uh, highlight here as a contribution is rather develop, uh, rather related to the development of school performance, such as we are keeping uh, through our interventions Romani students for a longer period of time in the school institutions, meaning that we are decreasing the time period of the dropout rate, as well as we are uh, contributing for more Romani students to continue their studies. As a result, there is an increasing number of Roma professionals, Roma employees, as well as change makers. Next slide, please. And now I uh, came to the point of talking more about the education and health relation between the two. Um, first of all, I want to highlight a general issue of from education, which is segregation. This is a present issue, present long-standing phenomena in most of the European countries. But there is a specific way of segregating Romani children, which is directly connected to heart issues. This is the misdiagnosis and misplacement of Romani children to special school institutions. This is a seriously concerning issue. Let me give an example from Slovakia, where 80% of the students are coming from Roma origin who are in special schools. So it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a really, really concerning issue, especially considering the numbers. Why it is like that? Number one, uh, there is a so-called intentional uh, way of segregation of Romani children by this tool. I mean, tool by the misplacement and misdiagnosis. The second is the diagnosis systems, the diagnosis tests are number one, outdated. Number two, those are only mainstream taken meaning that those are not sensitized for uh, minority communities. And here I'm talking about in general minority communities. When it comes to Roma, for instance, I can give you an example that those diagnosis systems are not uh, language sensitive, for instance. Because Roma children can be already put in uh, uh, special education institutions if a child cannot fully understand the test due to the lack of uh, the mainstream language. 
An other aspect for health and education relation is the vaccinations and the medical health checkup systems. So those are either mandatory or strongly recommended in European countries, although the information flow about its importance is very limited. So Romani communities, especially in remote areas, those they are not fully aware about the necessity of the vaccinations and medical health, uh, health checkup. That's why this is also a kind of hindering factor when they are trying to enter either ECD programs or to primary school. Um, thinking a little bit further about health, uh, let me address a little bit about the, the Roma professionals in the healthcare institutions. There is a so-called general public mindset or, or public belief that this is something elitist. This is something high level to be a professional in the, in the healthcare institutions. This is something that people can do who are coming from higher level of background, both on social and economic perspectives. Although, there is also a huge need for Romani uh, background people, Romani people to be healthcare professionals. That's why our foundation is providing the so-called Roma Health Scholarship Program in both EU and non-EU member states. But our goal is to support individuals for continuing their high, higher level education in the medical field in order they to be doctors, nurses, so on and so forth. And just uh, last year, yeah, in 2019, we have had quite a big conference with Rome Health Scholarship Program in Belgrade, where we gathered all of our beneficiaries and we are discussing a couple of aspects of the need for Roma professionals in healthcare institutions. And the last point of mine here is the so-called stereotypes that Roma in general face when it comes to health, when they are trying to access healthcare services, and also those Roma who are being employed in the in the in the, in the healthcare system and why it is important to be employed or to be included in the healthcare system as employees is not only about uh, social and economic issues but also about specifically tackling or challenging the stereotypes and here let me uh, think a little bit further one more step that those Romani uh, professionals who are in the healthcare systems, they are having a much better insight, not only through the policies that are applicable to their job or to their field, but also in the sense of what how the public observes them. And that's why uh, they are, their involvement in the healthcare system is greatly important also in terms of policy developments. This is what we have discussed also in our conference last year with uh, Roma professionals in healthcare institutions that what are those specific needs for uh, policy development in order to, to, to create a better environment, both for Romani communities and also for Roma professionals. Um, next slide, please. And very briefly about the pandemic and Roma education. Uh, with the, uh, with a couple of or <coughs> excuse me, a couple of organizations we have uh, basically issued various kinds of statements and, and, and proposals, both the European Commission and national ministries, on the matter of uh, addressing the challenges that Romar faced in, during the pandemic. Uh, if you don't mind, I don't read it out because I believe that it is quite obvious for all of us what are the challenges that Romar are facing. And uh, let me rather focus on what are the effects of the pandemic on Roma education and how those are related to health. So the number one pandemic effect on, on the education of Roma is the simplicity of, of the educational gap uh, being deepening or deepening between Roma and non-Roma communities because Roma are having no equal access, neither tools for remote education. And with, which is even more concerning that the challenges that are being present in this slide, those are in general, uh, general uh, present uh, challenges that Roma are facing. So those are not only coming up as challenges as, as, as due to the pandemic. So imagine the situation that generally there is a huge challenge that Roma are facing, plus there is a pandemic, then the, the effect of these two is even further deepening the, the, the social gap and also the economic gap between Roma and Roma communities. And Thinking from the other perspective, how these are affecting uh, Romani individuals, uh, that is in general uh, a weakened mental and, and physical status, health status due to the pandemic, due to there is no uh, equal access to remote education, there are no necessary tools, so on and so forth, that are further 
uh, making difficult the, the, the successful completion of, of educational programs. And uh, yes, I'm finishing it. And that is also, excuse me? No, don't worry, Jim. Just okay. Okay, and uh, that is also the physical distancing and isolation requested. So this is also again something that is making Roma and Norma even uh, making them further from each other. There is no interaction between the children. And the long-term uh, educational impact is the huge likelihood of, of school dropout rate. So uh, this is something that also policies and also policy makers as well as civil society needs to take into account when it comes to education, uh, how can we so-called tackle the issue of not even further deepening the school dropout rate from, from Romani uh, children. Um, I think this was my, my, my last slide, if I'm not mistaken. And just let me uh, finish it up with uh, highlighting the importance of inclusive policies, both in health and in education. I do believe that this is the, the right timing and even the biggest timing when both civil society and various kind of advocates needs to jointly unite their voice in order to bring indeed inclusive health and educational policies for Romani communities. Because on the long run, this is not only the issue of Roma, this is the issue of European societies that needs to be understood and that needs to be uh, seriously con uh, considered. Thank you very much for your attention and I'm happy for receiving a couple of questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Roland, very good points. Uh, I would like to remind the, the audience that they can use the chat to ask questions to the different speakers. Please, you can write the name of the speaker uh, you are addressing the question. And now we are going to move to the next speaker. Uh, this is Adriana Lamashkova. She's Senior Legal Advisor for Europe at the Center for Reproductive Rights, uh, a global legal advocacy NGO using the law to advance reproductive rights in Europe and across the world. And she's presenting on tackling health inequalities and sexual and reproductive rights of Roma women in the European Union member states and candidate countries. Uh, please, Adriana. Thank you, Daniel. It is an honor for me to have the opportunity to speak here today, and I would like to thank the European Public Health Alliance for inviting us to this important discussion. As Daniel mentioned, I have been asked to speak about inequalities experienced by Romani women with respect to enjoyment of their sexual and reproductive health and rights. I will try to briefly outline some of the issues and in doing so, I will address them from a human rights perspective, which is the perspective that the center is using in its work. We have been using the law to advance reproductive rights as fundamental human rights. In our work, we have partnered with local and regional civil society organizations and activists to raise awareness of violations and concerns related to a number of reproductive rights issues. This includes partnerships with organizations and advocates working to protect reproductive rights of Romani women. Most recently, we partnered with the Center for Civil and Human Rights to document experiences of Romani women in reproductive healthcare settings in Eastern Slovakia. I hope that my input will complement the detailed overview of uh, uh, the issues uh, that create and exacerbate health inequalities uh, that uh, Rados had outlined in her presentation. In many parts of Europe, women's sexual and reproductive health, autonomy and decision making remains threatened and violations of their sexual and reproductive rights continue to exist due to restrictive laws, policies or practices. A range of legal, policy, practical and social barriers continue to jeopardize women's sexual and reproductive health. At times, these restrictions and barriers affect all women. However, often they target many women and undocumented migrant women. Over the past few years, a number of civil society organizations have documented instances of human rights violations and discrimination that Romani women 
across the EU and in candidate countries space in reproductive health context. These have been outlined in the most recent European Parliament resolution on the implementation of national Roma integration strategies that was adopted in September. And they include access barriers as well as exacerbated forms of physical, psychological, verbal uh, abuse, racial harassment and ethnic segregation in maternal health care facilities. And they also include systematic practices of forced and coercive sterilization. In countries such as the Czech Republic and Slovakia, Romani women who had been subjected to forced or coercive sterilization have been unable to achieve justice and obtain, uh, obtain adequate reparations for several decades. Czech and Slovak policymakers should prioritize this issue and urgently move forward with adopting legislation that would ensure adequate reparations, including compensation to the survivors of these harmful practices. Forced and coercive sterilization experienced by Romani women and people from other marginalized communities is one of the worst forms of reproductive oppression. And it is imperative that respective governments and policymakers finally recognize these injustices and take necessary action to remedy them. International human rights law and standards require states to take effective measures to ensure that sexual and reproductive health services and information are available, accessible, affordable, acceptable and of good quality. They must also ensure that everyone can make their decision about sexual and reproductive health free from coercion, ill treatment or discrimination. States are also required to take measures to address and prevent all forms of racial, sex and gender discrimination against Romani women, including in reproductive health context. Yet Romani women across the EU and in candidate um, countries or across the, Euro the European region continue to face discrimination and barriers in access to affordable, good quality reproductive health care services that would be sensitive to their needs and perspectives and that would respect their dignity and autonomy. As recognized in the mentioned European Parliament resolution, as well as in the European Commission's proposal for a Council recommendation on Roma equality, inclusion and participation, it is important for Member States to address multiple intersectional and structural discrimination when tackling inequalities that Romani people face with respect to health and access to quality healthcare services. The EU institutions have recognized that member states should develop measures to improve access to good quality and affordable health care for Romani people, including sexual and reproductive health care, and that a key element in that regard is improving access to Member states should adopt measures that will improve access to quality healthcare services, particularly for Romani women, Romani children, Romani LGBTI people, Romani people with disabilities and other marginalized Romani populations. They should also analyze and acknowledge the phenomenon of anti-gypsism and raise awareness of its existence, the forms it takes and its harmful consequences, including in reproductive healthcare settings. When speaking about Tackling inequalities in sexual and reproductive health context, it is also important to mention backlash against gender equality and sexual and reproductive rights that we have witnessed over the past few years in Europe and across the world. The main areas of this backlash appear to be common across countries. They include institutional and policy framework for gender equality, sexual and reproductive rights issues such as access to contraception, assisted reproduction and abortion care, sexuality education and LGBTI rights. They also include a concerted backlash against the Council of Europe Convention on Preventing and Combating Violence Against Women and Domestic Violence, known as Istanbul Convention. In a number of EU country, member states, as well as at the EU level, coordinated campaigns against the ratification of the Istanbul Convention have, been, have taken place which led some countries to withdraw from the convention and others to refrain from ratifying it. At times, this backlash has taken place in tandem with the rise of populist, far-right, nationalist and xenophobic movements in Europe. 
When addressing and tackling inequalities in healthcare, it is also important to take account of other social justice issues that impact people's health, including women's sexual and reproductive health. And it is crucial that policymakers, as well as civil society organizations and other stakeholders, enable equal participation of Romani women activists and organizations in discussions and decision-making processes on the respective issues, as well as in designing, shaping, and implementing policies and measures that are aimed at addressing, tackling, and preventing inequalities in reproductive healthcare context. Thank you. Thank you very much, Adriana. Uh, it's very important uh, to introduce the human rights ap approach when we are talking about health inequalities and also to remind us the important uh, diversity within the Roma uh, population. And finally, uh, to remind us that policies can't be gender blind. Uh, we, we should always uh, consider gender equity when talking about uh, the different forms of inequity. And now, uh, last but not least, we have um, as our next speaker, Daniela Miranda, who is going to discuss about uh, strengthening Roma participation. She's um, a doctoral candidate at the Universidad de Sevilla, at the Department of Social Psychology. And she works as a researcher at the Center of Community Research and Action at the Universidad de Sevilla, which is developing uh, methodologies based on uh, stakeholder collaborations, policy synergies, effective communication, and uh, utiliza utilization of uh, available resources. Um, please, uh, Daniela, the floor is yours. Thank you, Daniel. Um, first, I would like to say thank you to the European Public Health Alliance and especially to Rados for the opportunity to share some reflections from our experience at the community level. Um, over the last years, we've collaborated very closely with Roma women in neighborhoods here in Sevilla. And the presentation is based off of our experience, our framework, and also for this presentation, uh, we've included the voices of the women that we've collaborated with in my presentation. <laughs> Well, I can outline at least what I'm going to talk about first. I'm going to be speaking about the challenges and opportunities for participation. Oh, here we go. Perfect. Uh, thank you. Um, so I wanted to highlight some challenges and opportunities for Roma participation, but from a, a community-based uh, lens. First, I wanted to speak about the consequences of the absence of Roma participation in generating evidences and participating in research methodologies and advocacy work. Um, this is, many times Roma communities have played a secondary role and both in the tools and methods that we utilize in research are exclusionary and are not defined by community priorities. And many times a representation is overcast by larger Roma organizations or non-Roma researchers and professionals. And the consequences are programs and policies that do not, that Roma communities do not identify with. And of course, this causes a perception in the majority society that Roma communities are helpless. And this, this, um, this system of science and evaluation is just replicated in the press of system and has caused marginalization. And the consequences of marginalization at the local level is the high perceived sense that Roma people uh, sense this abandonment from services and public services and has caused fragmentation between institutionalized resources and resources that are important to the community. Um, we recently did a social network analysis of uh, in two local context of the resources available to the community. And what we saw was that there is high density in 
Roma faith-based organizations and small groups, grassroots organizations where there is high Roma participation, yet fragmentation with institutions where resources are being invested. Um, of course, this has its silver lining in the fact that this proves that Roma have a high capacity of resilience and resistance at the local level. Um, and I wanted to kind of echo a little bit what Roland was saying before of COVID-19, we can't overlook recent events and the consequences. And I think it reflects well this, these challenges and the opportunities at the same time. We all know the living conditions of many Roma communities and I don't wanna generalize, this is my experience here in Sevilla and my team's experience in Sevilla. But during the pandemic and during emergencies, NGOs and local teachers in these neighborhoods provided emergency supplies such as food, but as soon as the intense lockdown measures ended in Spain, uh, those services were absolutely abandoned when we went back to a new type of normality. And recently with schools opening, uh, many families did not want to send their kids back to school because the protocols were developed without Roma participation, not even at the public schools in their neighborhoods. And many families did not trust the schools. It was very symbolic to them. The, uh, non-Roma professionals for them, combined with the fear of COVID-19, um, did not want to take their, uh, their children back to school and, of course, have been blamed for not having a culture of education and have been even threatened by social services and law enforcement to take their children back to school. But yet many families have resisted together and have both not taken their children back to school and slowly over the past weeks together have decided to take their children back to school. So this reflects the influence and recognition that Roma have at the local level. And if we could go to the next slide, please. So, so the question in our framework tries to answer is how can we ensure that Roma have opportunities to develop socio-political influence and recognition at the local level? And so we link together two main ideas, like you can see in the, in the diagram to the left, in the outer circle, that is an advocacy process. And then the inner so circle is sociopolitical development. So I wanted to define quickly what socio, what we consider sociopolitical development from a community-based um, definition. And that is gaining, the community gaining a deeper political understanding of discrimination and the political nature of health inequities. And sociopolitical control has three main pillars. First is developing critical knowledge, building critical knowledge with the community through methods that engage in conversation, in reflection, and connecting their daily experiences and building a theory and developing evidences around their daily experiences to challenge existing evidence. Um, next is expanding their social support. So not only within their families, but also expanding to local organizations, faith-based organizations, healthcare professionals, researchers to support in advocating based on those evidences. And lastly, taking action in local advocacy work together with that social support. Um, so we understand advocacy as a way to develop sociopolitical con control for marginalized communities. And next slide, please. So I wanted to just highlight some key ideas for what does this look like in the day-to-day -day practice? And first that policies, anti-racist policies and practices should follow trauma-informed care. That means developing real relationships. So stakeholders, non-Roma professionals, Roma professionals, non-Roma, Roma people together, building real relationships based on trust. Not only is it about the community sharing their experiences, but also reflecting on, for example, for me as a researcher, what is my identity and how do I play into the methods and the evidence that we develop together? This also implies changing the role of different stakeholders, um, that horizontal relationships such as Roma NGOs developing evaluations that considers the community perspective, um, especially uh, more invisible parts of the community and providing that peer support and 
bridging those different types of alliances that organizations do have. Um, next is recognizing that Roma community has the capacity to represent themselves when given the opportunities and the tools to do so. And finally, as a researcher, we have the civic responsibility of providing those resources and tools and supporting advocacy based on leadership um, of Roma people. And finally, promoting synergies with existing policy initiatives, for example, current local COVID-19 stimulus plans, which is what we're trying to do now here in Sevilla, and other larger plans, such as those directed towards climate change that Rados had mentioned earlier, and also including influential actors from the community in that participation. Next slide, please. And for the purpose of this participation, I'm not Roma, um, and it was important to ensure that the voices of the women that have collaborated with us would be a part of this space. And so for the purpose of this presentation, I had a conversation with seven women, and I asked them, what challenges do you have as a Roma woman in defending your rights? And if you were standing in front of EU policymakers, what message would you like to say to them? And so based on those narratives, um, I developed four main priorities uh, together with them. Uh, the first is that they want and need resources and opportunities to advocate. Without that, there will be no progress. Um, and that this is a chain of events. Uh, not only is it the, el uh, the, the mothers I work with, but their children and the parents, and it's a generational for their physical and mental health. Second is to recognize an intersectional approach. Uh, Roma women experience several forms of discrimination within and outside of their community. Uh, third is a Roma recognition, not only how non-Roma perceive them, but working in a horizontal way to be recognized in a different, in a, in a equal way, um, and also building trust uh, with one another. And finally, changing the, per the perception that they're capable of change, uh, working at the local level and small actions with the support of non-Roma to resist normalizing unjust living conditions. And that, that is the end of my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Daniela. Um, very good presentation, uh, reminding us uh, that we cannot talk about Roma policies if the Roma are not participating in the decision, uh, in making the decisions affecting their lives. And now, um, well, the time has gone for <laughs> the discussion, but I think maybe we can make the time for one or two questions. I see that we have one question um, through the Excel I have received. Uh, I would like to ask to the organizers if we have the time to to put this question. Yes, we have time for one question. Okay, so thank you very much. Well, the question is from uh, Paola Pellini. Uh, she says, Roma, I think the question is addressing uh, Daniela. And she asks, Roma face major obstacles for participating in policy and decision making. Social and political participation is much more challenging for Roma women who are subjected to ethnic and gender discrimination. What are the solutions for strengthening Roma social and political participation in local advocacy and policy development? Um, well, from our experience here, many times is using community spaces. Uh, for example, we did, we rose, uh, the women were very worried about the waste management. And so one of the things that we did was using key spaces in the community to gain alliances with other community members because the community was being blamed. Um, and we also partnered identifying organizations that do have more political weight. Um, so I think that it's using spaces, resources within the community 
Um, as a researcher, my job was to do the logistical aspects and assure that when we did have the meetings that it was the women who were in charge of using their voice and using the tools that we could provide uh, from our institution. Um, so I also think it's first using the community capacity and sharing the resources and finding alliances with other organizations to, to advocate at the local level. I hope that answers partially. I think it's probably a lot more complicated than that example, but thank you. That's for sure is a very long <laughs> question. Um, thank you very much, Daniela. Uh, now, according with the schedule, we are going to move to the second uh, panel. Second panel is about uh, reducing health inequalities, priorities and solutions in the post 2020 period. The discussion panel is going to be moderated by Sultan Masai Kushevich, who is the policy manager for health policy coherence leading the European Public Health Alliance work on the political, environmental and social determinants of health in policy areas, areas such as international trade, clean air, and health inequalities. Thank you very much. Thank you, and thank you very much, uh, Daniel, for that introduction. And um, I, am, I have to admit that uh, I did work in the past also in the Roma policy, so this is uh, also a topic very close to my heart. So uh, I, I'm really pleased uh, to be here with you. Um, indeed, uh, uh, we just uh, discussed uh, in the previous panel um, the um, opportunities and um, uh, challenges linked to Roma health and inequalities. And uh, listening to all the speakers, I have heard many times participation, inclusion, uh, collaboration, evidence, leadership, words like this, which are building blocks of, of advocacy at grassroots and European level. And this is at the heart of, of the second panel discussion. Um, indeed, uh, so the, the panel will uh, discuss uh, um, priorities and solutions in the post-2020 period. And first, I would like to proceed with introducing our uh, um, panel members. So first, uh, uh, we are uh, uh, very happy to have uh, MEP Roma of France from the European Parliament, from the group of uh, the Greens political group from Germany, and uh, first and foremost being a Roma MEP. He is himself an adamant advocate uh, for uh, pro-Roma uh, inclusion and deeply committed to strengthen the EU legislation for increasing the protection of Roma rights. Um, I have to mention that he presented a report on Roma inclusion, which was adopted by the European Parliament. And also as a result of this initiative, we now have a resolution uh, aiming at, uh, at combating persistent anti-gypsism resulting in housing, health, employment and education inequalities. We're very happy to have you, uh, MEP France, with us. Um, the second uh, panel member uh, is uh, Marcella Adamova from the European Commission. Uh, he, she is a policy officer responsible for health uh, uh, within the unit uh, dealing with the non discriminations and Roma coordination. We call it as DG Just, and this is the unit uh, responsible for the coordination of, of Roma policies within, within the Commission. And although uh, Maya Saitovic, uh, the third panel member from the Open Society Foundation, also um, wanted to, to join this, um, uh, this discussion, but unfortunately this was not possible. Uh, nevertheless, um, uh, we would like to um, showcase a short video message from IFA, uh, which also includes some important uh, messages, which I think uh, is relevant for, for the discussion and uh, for the topic as well. Uh, just before the question and answer session. And maybe at the beginning, may I mention that um, we also have, um, I can see many familiar names among the participants, and we are very happy that so many uh, could join us, um, including also Dora Hus, who is team leader in, in the European Commission, and uh, she might be also here uh, um, with us with the question. So um, you can take it as also, uh, an encouragement that do not hesitate to, to put forward questions. Uh, the chat function is available in Zoom, so, so you, can, you can use that. I would like to also mention that uh, the discussion is not limited to this room. So we would like to also uh, broaden it. We are using a, a social media and Twitter particularly where, where um, um, important interventions and messages are there. 
and any of you is welcome to, to use them using the hashtag Roma Health and the hashtag Health Inequalities. So I think with that, um, um, uh, without any further delay, we can move to the, to the panel discussions. And it is my pleasure to invite uh, MEP Romeo France to make his presentation about the role of EU legislation for reducing uh, health inequalities. MEP um, uh, France, you have the floor. Thank you very much, dear ladies and gentlemen. Thanks a lot uh, for the opportunity to address you First, I would like to congratulate the organizers for the hard work to make the Romani Health Network possible and to launch it during these difficult times. COVID-19 pandemic makes the life of our people very, very difficult and it threats their health as without water to wash their hands and without basic sanitary conditions. Romani people were first in the fire line. On the other hand, we could have seen public authorities imposing brutal lockdowns measures for our people in communities from Bulgaria, Slovakia or Romania, instead of making sure they have access to what they need to stay safe from infection. Our communities are so of the most vulnerable, but not because they want to, but because many member states are neglecting their situation for so many years. We already know how bad the situation is. The data are telling it and there is no need to mention them because actually it is a reality, which is the strongest proof. For a couple of times I have visited a Romani community in Romania called Tinka. It's near the Hungarian border. And you see for many people, especially for the Gaje Sikh with anti-Gypsism, it's easy to say Romani people do not like to go to school or work. They are wrong. Let me give you the example of Tinka. More than 60% more than of Romani children have hepatitis A. You know why? The garbage from the village is stored exactly at the entrance of this marginalized community. Children are being bitten by rats, are walking with bare feet, even during winter, do not have clothes to wear, they are not vaccinated, and they have absolutely, absolutely no access to healthcare services. When I was there, I have invited a deputy director from the county health department. It was in Oradia. Um, <clears throat> just a moment, health, yes. And in the begging, she thought uh, she will not enter in the community because she was afraid of getting sick. However, I taught her, this is your job. Who should help them, if not you, and the health mediator. You see, there are so many communities such Tinka in Europe. When people get sick, and when some are lucky to get some treatment, the illness comes back because it is impossible to cure when you are getting back in the same dangerous environment. No sanitation, no water, no canalization, a lot of garbage, no environmental and health justice. These people do not matter for the public authorities, but only if they are obliged by law to take care of them. By a specific targeted law, cause we have mainstream legisl legislation, but if you our public authorities are legitimizing their work for Romani people, and I know cases. This is one of the reasons for which I have developed the resolution asking for a Romani law and which was voted with a consistent majority of four, five, uh, 504, uh, 50, uh, 45 votes in September. Now the commission must come with the legislation text. The law will make sure that member states will develop measures to improve the health condition of our people 
and will allocate adequate funding for the implementation. This is a chance to reduce the life expectancy gap between Romani and non-Romani people, which is now even 15 years lower for our people, to reduce infant mortality, which is now three and even four times higher for our people than for the general population, and ensure a good start in life for our children, as the first thousand days are very important for a healthy early childhood development. Combating health inequalities and promoting environmental justice are priorities of my work and I assure you all of my support. Devlesa and thank you. Thank you very much, uh, MEP France, for making that remark and uh, also reminding us um, one of the core elements of, of, of Roma inclusion is, is, is the grassroots level, because we, we can discuss national policies, we can discuss European policies, but, but the example of, of Tinka and that community and that those health challenges are tangible, that's, that should, I think, guide the, the, guide the uh, decision makers. And as you just mentioned, also as a democratically elected uh, uh, representative of, of, of European people, um, and many uh, with, with your colleagues, you adopted that resolution, which is indeed uh, calling for action. And, and then, then it is, um, um, I would say, then the European Commission side to, to assess that. And maybe that's, that's a nice way to, to go to the next presentation. Um, mm. uh, um, Marcella uh, from, uh, fr from the Commission will speak uh, about health inequalities in the context of the EU framework for Roma equality and in inclusion. Marcella, uh, you have the floor. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm going to present a revised and strengthened EU Roma strategic framework for equality, inclusion and participation, which was adopted by the European Commission very recently on October the 7th. And I will try to focus particularly on the health related part. Uh, slide, please. I will start my presentation by briefly recalling some facts and figures about Roma people in Europe. Uh, then I will continue with the COVID-19 impact on the Roma communities. I will speak about objectives and targets of the new strategic framework. And uh, I will conclude with some important novelties of, the new, uh, of, the, of this new initiative. Slide, please. As we all know, Roma are an integral part of Europe's society and economy. However, uh, many Roma people face socioeconomic exclusion, discrimination, and uh, anti-gypsism in their daily lives. And uh, these are also social determinants of poor quality health of uh, many Roma people. Let me to quote just a few examples. Uh, as you can see uh, in the graph, four out of every five Roma are at risk of poverty, and the situation with Roma children uh, is, uh, is even worse. Share of Roma people in housing deprivation is 61% and share of Roma people with access to tap water is only 80% compared to 98% in the general population. Slide please. With regards to discrimination, a Eurobarometer report from May 2019 specifies the share of respondents who consider that anti-Roma discrimination is uh, widespread in their countries uh, uh, at 61%. And this uh, makes Roma the group against whom discrimination is most pervasive across the EU. Slide, please. The situation when it comes to the life expectancy uh, uh, difference between uh, Roma and non-Roma is also alarming. Roma women live, as it was already mentioned, 10.4 uh, years less, and Roma men live 10.2 years less compared to uh, non-Roma. Unfortunately, progress over the last years has been, uh, has been limited or, uh, or minimal. Slide, please. I would also like to underline that the COVID-19 pandemic has uh, had uh, a particularly severe effect on marginalized Roma communities, overcrowded households, and the lack of access to healthcare, clean water, regular income, or financial resources are just some of the factors increasing the vulnerability of uh, Roma in uh, the crisis such as COVID-19. 
Additionally, the mid-term socioeconomic impact of the pandemic puts Rom put Roma communities at risk of uh, sliding further into these inequalities. And at the same time, the use of uh, restrictive measures aiming to prevent uh, public health has sometimes reinforced discrimination and uh, even violence uh, against marginalized Roma. Slide, please. Yeah. So when preparing the new EU Roma strategic framework, we have taken into account the conclusions of an in-depth evaluation of the EU framework for national Roma integration strategies up to 2020. While this evaluation clearly showed the previous framework's EU added value, it also demonstrated that its ambition of putting an end uh, to the exclusion of Roma has not yet been achieved. Its conclusions attest to a clear need for a long-term commitment at all levels, at EU level, national level, regional, and also local levels, in order to achieve uh, um, sustainable progress and sustainable uh, positive changes. I would also like to point out that the EU Agency for Fundamental Rights has been an important partner in the preparation of this new framework. Uh, uh, Fundamental Rights Agency, or shortly FRA, has developed a set of equality and inclusion indicators, and it is conducting uh, regular service, which will be an important source of information in monitoring progress up to 2030. Slide, please. While the previous framework, uh, which is coming to the end now, uh, was focused primarily on social and economic inclusion of marginalized Roma communities, this uh, new strategic framework sets out a comprehensive three pillar, pillar approach for the next 10 years. So social and economic inclusion of marginalized Roma is, is complemented by promoting equality and fostering active participation. The framework thus aims to give all Roma the opportunity to realize their full potential and engage in political, social, economic, and, and cultural life. Slide, please. Uh, the new strategic framework has got seven objectives. Uh, first one is fighting and preventing anti-gypsism and discrimination. Then it's reducing poverty and exclusion to close the socioeconomic gap, promoting participation through empowerment and trust, better access to mainstream education, better access to sustainable employment, of course, be of course better access, uh, better health and access to healthcare, and better access to desegregated housing. For each of these seven objectives, the new strategic framework proposes two or three uh, quantitative headline targets. And these targets are associated to indicators which will allow uh, effective monitoring and measuring the progress achieved. I also would like to emphasize that these targets express uh, the minimum progress that we want to achieve by 2030. Our long-term aim uh, remains to, ens to ensure effective equality and fully close the gap between Roma and the general population. Uh, slide, uh, next slide, please. So I can give you some uh, uh, examples of these e EU targets uh, by 2030. Uh, with regards to equality, the new strategic framework aims to cut the proportion of Roma experiencing discrimination by at least half, or in the area of inclusion, it aims to reduce the poverty gap uh, by at least half. It also aims to ensure that at least 95% of Roma have access to tap water. It aims to cut the life expectancy gap uh, by at least half, uh, reduce the gap in housing deprivation by at least one third, uh, cutting the gap in participation and in an early childhood education by at least half, or cutting the gap employment, uh, the gap in gender employment uh, by at least uh, half. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, and uh, in this slide, we can see only a few examples uh, from uh, the uh, proposed council recommendation uh, commission proposal for council recommendations. Uh, 
for example, combat and, uh, and prevent, prevent uh, potential, out, potential outbreaks in marginalized or remote Roma localities is also one of the measures uh, recommended to the member states, uh, promote access to medical studies for Roma people and encourage the recruitment of Roma as health practitioners and mediators, particularly in uh, regions with a significant Roma uh, population. Um, we also encourage member states to fight digital exclusion of Roma in access to healthcare services, uh, prevent and eliminate segregated healthcare services and ensure recognition and uh, rep reparation for past injustices, including already mentioned for sterilization of Roma women. Uh, equal access uh, without barriers to quality healthcare services, especially uh, for those groups that are most at risk and those living in marginalized and remote uh, uh, localities. Next slide, please. Let me now highlight some of the most important new elements of this uh, reformed and reinforced EU Roma strategic framework. First of all, uh, this uh, new strategic framework gives a strong focus on diversity among Roma. It aims to ensure that national strategies meet the specific needs of different groups, such as Roma women, youth, children, EU mobile citizens, stateless people, LGBTI people, uh, older Roma, as well as those living with disabilities. It also encourages intersectional approach the new strategic framework uh, also reaches out to all Roma, regardless of their socioeconomic status. This approach uh, simply recognizes that all Roma can experience discrimination, including those who do not suffer socioeconomic ex exclusion. And uh, it also acknowledges that inclusion is a two-way process in which both sides need to make an effort. This is why uh, the new strategic framework targets uh, not only Roma, but all of society. The new strategic framework gives also a stronger focus to combine the mainstreaming of Roma inclusion across relevant policy areas with targeted measures, which uh, support an effective equal access of Roma to rights and services. And in addition, it also aims to accommodate differences between EU countries while increasing commitment and accountability. It therefore adopts a common but also differentiated approach among member states. Slide, please. In conclusion, I would like to give you an overview of the main elements of this new initiative, which consists of uh, three main components. First one is communication with two annexes, which provides guidance for national strategies and portfolio of indicators to allow monitoring process. Proposal for council recommendation, which guidance for concrete measures to achieve EU objectives and targets. And a staff working document, which provides a detailed presentation of the analytical, methodological and the contextual basis of this new initiative. Slide, please. So uh, thank you very much for your attention and I'm looking forward to, uh, for uh, the discussion. Thank you very much, Marcella, for that, uh, for that comprehensive uh, presentation and then presenting um, how did the European Commission respond to, to the demand. And indeed, there is, there is a 10 year strategy now. And uh, you also made a clear point uh, about the intersexual uh, um, nature of it that uh, uh, and especially how many entry points are there for health. Uh, and then indeed, uh, as you uh, highlighted in one of your last slides, there is also then a role for the, for the member states as well, <laughs> because they also play a crucial role to make those, um, those um, measures to happen and, and to implement that. Um, so with, with that, we are following our agenda. And before uh, moving uh, to the short video um, I just uh, um, mentioned um, at the beginning, may I just uh, remind you that if you would like to, to go um, on, on social media and Twitter, do not hesitate to use the Roma Health and Health Inequities so that all the measures uh, messages can be captured there. And um, uh, also uh, the opportunity is, is there to, um, 
uh, to, to put questions uh, right after the video. So do not hesitate to, uh, to use that as well. Having said that, then um, uh, I would like to um, um, uh, ask for, for your attention and my colleagues will then um, uh, make visible a short video about the social impact of health inequalities. Thank you very much uh, um, for that. I, I hope um, um, you could um, um, uh, clearly see and, and digest the messages. And with that, uh, I would like to move to the questions now. And uh, I have the first questions uh, um, already, which sounds like, um, uh, would you be able to comment on whether in the United Kingdom, we will be able to ask the government to follow the measures? And uh, I think the question has both a political and a legal nature. So for the political side, for the parliament, uh, MEP France, as, as, a, as there are no MEPs in the parliament uh, from the UK, but uh, the question is, uh, is there any connections with, with, with Roma in the UK? You are in contact with them or, or there is any connections between the parliament and, and the Roma? And respectively for the commission, how, how the commission does with, uh, with, with the United Kingdom, uh, uh, noting that uh, they just left uh, 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 the Union. So maybe MEP France, you would like to come first? Yes, now, uh, how you know we have the we have a Brexit. I'm very uh, sad about this, but we are in, uh, in, in, in contact, in touch with our people there in, in uh, uh, Great Britain and in United Kingdom and in a very tight uh, contact with them. And, and yeah, but now we have really a problem as uh, the United Kingdom is not more a part of our EU, of our family. And um, now we must see how we can implement, implement uh, this uh, strategy. But I think uh, we have, my focus is now on the very bad, on the very, very bad side on the, of the East Europe, like in Romania or Bulgaria, that we have seen that in COVID-19 times, uh, the people was 
in a very, very bad condition. And um, I think uh, here, here th that's in East Europe for our minorities, especially for the Romani people, it's, it's a question of surviving now. Surviving, uh, for the, uh, surviving about anti-gypsism that we must mention. Anti-gypsism is the biggest form of racism what we have in Europe that shows now uh, COVID-19. And um, the plan, the strategy plan of the EU is very, it's, it's very good. But I ask myself, how many time have our people to wait again 10 years when you have a mayor, and I mentioned this situation in Tinka, when you have a mayor who is an anti-gypsist, how you will implement something who's voluntary, what is only a recommendation, and that shows the past, the last 10 years, that uh, you have no chance to implement this strategy when you, are, when you must work together with anti-gypsists and racists. You know, they are laughing about a strategy. They need they need something who was uh, what will be binding you need a winding character that they know when they don't do it they go punished and then i think that's the only real change in the whole europe to change something for our minorities because all our minorities not only the romani people all minorities has no equal access cause about racism discrimination that's the biggest reason that all the minorities have not the equal success uh, and the equal access uh, to to uh, equal access to participate, and, and that we can only I can we can solve only this problem with a legislative uh, law and uh, that we need an I will fight for this. But I think I'm very I'm sure that we can change this situation when we have a law an equal law for minorities. Uh, thanks uh, uh, very much, uh, MEP France, for that. Uh, maybe the Commission uh, uh, would like to comment uh, the, the questions. Uh, uh, yes, uh, as uh, the UK is no longer the member of the uh, European Union, they are no longer obliged to have uh, uh, such a national strategy for Roma, for Roma inclusion. Uh, but they can still decide, you know, if they want to, if they want to have such strategy or not. But they are not obliged uh, 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 to uh, to to have such a, to have such strategy as they are not uh, the EU member anymore. Thanks for for clarifying that aspect. Um, and I can see there are there are many questions. So let uh, let um, uh, us address as many as we can in the given time. The next question is. Um, it sounds like this. We heard lots of challenges regarding health that need to be addressed, yet not much positive results. Nevertheless, now with the new Roma strategy and strong EP European Parliament Roma representations are in place, what leverages and tools the European Commission and the European Parliament would employ to push the EU and pre-accession governments to bring those positive and concrete mid and long term results? So the question is about what concrete tools uh, are available, both on the European Parliament and the Commission side now in the given framework to address the situation. Uh, maybe again, MEP uh, France first. Thank you very much. Um, I think let us, let us take a look in the past, in the last 10 years. And in my report, I mentioned it, I analyzed the the last 10 years. The problem was all the approaches was paternalistic approaches. On who works, who works on, the fee, on, on, the, on, the, on the field? This one knows that paternalistic approach has no success and are not sustainable. So the next point is our people, the affected people of racism was not really involved in the solution conception. That must change. When you want to solve this problem, you must, you must take these people, the affected people, as an equal partner from beginning on to the, in, in the solution conception. So, and 
we don't need paternalistic approaches. We, not, we need non-paternalistic approaches. And we need the adequate funding. We need a number. How much you need? And what very, and then I take a look at the East Europe corruption. It's a big, it's a, it's a big problem there. We need a very good monitoring. In this monitoring must be the affected people too involved. These are very, very uh, uh, important to have a success. And I tell you, only this one can be happen as, as a success when we have a law. When the commission comes with a law, and now I, we have really a, a good time that, that the parliament is with the majority behind this resolution who calls for a law. And now we must work that the commission came at, by our side of the parliament and we can work with the, with the council to convince the council that we will do this. And I will do personally, I told this, the commission too, I will go to all the ministers in, from the 27 uh, states, the member states, to speak with them that they will, with this, with this law, they will uh, go agree. And that's my work for, because I am so convinced that, that only a law can help to change this situation. And our people has not 10 years more time to play with them to make a test. Uh, th thanks for that and elaborating so clearly about uh, the, the role of the parliament and how can you give voice and then indeed political pressure to, to make ch uh, changes happen at, at policy level. But what tools are there or uh, um, the commission can or ready to use? I don't know if, if Marcela or Dora would like to answer. I can come in. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes, Dora, we can Hello, hear you. Hello, I, I am Dora, who is also from the same team as Marcella. Uh, and I wanted to react a bit on, on the what, what can be done by legislation and what needs to be done by other means. So I think it is very important to look at equality legislation, look at what we have with the racial equality directive, with the council framework decision, on combating racism and xenophobia, which is of course not perfect. So we, there we have to look at what, what, is, uh, um, what is a weakness linked to enforcement and what is a weakness linked to a potential gap in legislation. And here the uh, recent anti-racism action plan that the commission adopted in September before the EU Roma strategic framework actually committed to come out with an implementation report on the racial equality directive which would also assess legislation and propose uh, new legislation in case it identifies gaps. And it also hinted at directions uh, such as equality bodies, the role of equality bodies, for example, in strategic litigation, and also the uh, fact that the racial equality directive does not cover law enforcement and public administration. So in these cases, it does make sense to, to look at legislation. But uh, there is also another very, very important policy areas which are under the EU Roma strategic framework, which is education, employment, healthcare, and housing. And these are areas which are primarily in member state competencies. And the treaty says that the commission's role is supporting and uh, promoting uh, promoting uh, cooperation and complementing member state action. So this is the limit of the, of the commission competencies. This is where we use a model which has been tested under the European semester of Europe 2020, where the commission is proposing EU level headline targets, which member states have to translate into national targets. And there is a monitoring. And actually even there, it is linked to the use of structural funds so I would not say that we have no tools. I think we have very important tools, but these tools are not through uh, legislation. These tools are, are through the so-called uh, open method of coordination that, that is used also for the European Semester of Europe 2020. And we are using the same tools in order to mobilize EU funding under the 2021-2027 financial period 
And as a result, for example, the Commission's position in these negotiations is that countries which have challenges highlighted in the European semester on inclusive education for Roma, so that, uh, and also where other challenges are flagged in the semester, and these include, for example, Bulgaria, Czech Republic, Hungary, Romania, Slovakia, Spain, and Greece, that they should choose the specific objectives under uh, the EU funds, the ESF plus, uh, that target Roma explicitly, and they would have to meet a so-called enabling condition, which, for example, requires measures to fight segregation. So, indeed, the tools are quite wide-ranging, but unfortunately, legislation is not always the, the answer. Also, I would like to recall the experience so far with the Horizontal Equal Treatment Directive, that has been proposed by the Commission in 2008 and that is still on the table. So that is also something we have to keep in mind when we talk about discussing a new directive, that it might take much more than 10 years to, to have it accepted. Uh, so I think we have to be really smart in the use of tools and use legislation where it is possible and use other policy and funding instruments uh, in, in where it, is, it makes more sense. Thank you very much, uh, Dora. And indeed, we have uh, we face uh, an extremely complex picture when we in the, in the have legislation and non-legislative tools. And uh, I guess it, there is a mix between the two. And, and thanks for elaborating at, le at least then how what, what is uh, what can the Commission do uh, within within the limits. Uh, and good to hear uh, uh, the approaches that that you, you just highlighted. Okay, so uh, moving to the to the uh, next question. Um, it is coming from uh, Borjan Pavlovsky from uh, uh, North Mat Macedonia. Does the EU plans to include the Roma strategy and its proper implementation and proper budgeting in the negotiation process for uh, candidate states in the process of accessing the EU, including uh, North, Northern Macedonia? This will be crucial leverage for our advocacy process for improvement of the status of Roma in North Macedonia. Uh, so maybe I think it is it is directed more uh, uh, to 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 um, the commission. I can answer this maybe. Yeah, uh, the Western Balkan Balkan partners, similarly to the EU member states, uh, semester process present annual economic reform programs, including reforms to boost competitiveness and improve condition for inclusive growth and job creation. Uh, social inclusion, poverty reduction, and equal opportunities uh, are a part of uh, part of this uh, report. And 2021-2027 uh, instruments for pre-accession assistance only adopted will continue to support reforms and alignment with uh, EU requirements at uh, regional and national level. Um, so uh, basically, uh, uh, the EU uh, um, the EU is going to uh, support uh, support measures and uh, policies in the pre-accession uh, in assessment uh, states uh, in line with uh, this new uh, European framework. And I don't know if Dora wants to add something to this. No, I, I fully agree. And uh, I see that also Dorte from the engineer is among the audience, so maybe she wants to add something specifically on the enlargement issue. Thank you very much, Dora. Uh, hello, I'm Dr. Helena Foss. I'm from the European Commission, DG Near. Um, yes, I, I can concur with what was uh, said previously by the colleagues uh, that we will, of course, uh, implement this uh, strategy in uh, the enlargement region and neighborhood regions uh, in as far as it's possible. In, and uh, the negotiation framework uh, already uh, have some some clear indications on on how uh, how much and in, in as far as the, the the candidate countries should uh, align with EU policies. Um, as to so, I, I can only say that it, it's already been done uh, since two thousand eleven. Uh, and we are working actively uh, in the in the regions. Thank you. 
and thank you very much also for, for um, coming into the discussion. We, are, we have two minutes left for, for the discussions, but maybe there is still time for a, for a question. Um, um, since Ukraine, it is still about the candidate countries, since Ukraine isn't a member of the EU and Roma people also have heavy problems in areas of healthcare, education, employment, housing and political representations, all affected by discriminations, what practical help can uh, or support Roma population in Ukraine from the European Parliament? So I think this is for MEP France. <laughs> Look, it's, uh, it's, 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 it's very important to see these facts. It is really urgency that we solve this problem. And we must solve one problem that the national states recognized that we have not a Roma problem. We have a racism problem and they have a racism problem. That is, that is really, uh, it's really important that they see us. You know, our people there in the, in the east of Europe, they are uh, really affected of uh, exploitation too, and very bad exploitation. When you know these things, then you, can, then you can recognize the urgency what we have in these things. Uh, each state who wants to be a member of the EU must respect this uh, strategy and uh, these things like um, yeah, that, that, that uh, there are minorities and minority rights. But here is the, this problem too, like in North Macedonia or Kosovo or in each state, when it's something voluntary and it's only a recommendation, it is very easy to say, yes, we want to do it. Kosovo, the government tells me, yes, Mr. Franz, we want to do this. It's no problem. We want to do this. But for a, to say yes to a recommendation, it's very easy. It's very easy. But you see, in the reality and in the implementation, then, then it's more helpful a law. Then they must do it. Because when they don't do it, they go punished. And that's in every country, so it's in, it's in Germany too. In Germany, in the last 10 years, they don't implement the National Action Plan. So Germany, <coughs> don't do this. So why? It was a recommendation. And you must change, I mentioned this again, we must change the focus. We have no Roma, no Roma problem, we have a racism problem. Anti-Gypsism must be recognized for this problem and we must work with the majority too, because they are sick with anti-gypsism, you know? And this is a problem. These are some really important things to change the situation in all the states. And I think for my, for my side, I was, uh, from, from my side is a, rec a, a recommendation. It's very easy to say yes, but the law is something other things that you must that, that I think that's, that's the key to change. Thank you very much for making that point. Uh, the discussion starts to be really interesting and there are also many questions, but unfortunately we are reached uh, the time limit of that panel discussion, but that doesn't mean the end of the discussion. The event still continues because we are moving to the conclusion sites. I, I also saw some questions addressed to IFA, maybe that and other questions might be answered by, uh, by um, speakers um, uh, in the conclusions. Uh, part and also don't forget the social media discussion is continuing there so we have seen the questions so we will uh, try to accommodate them and which brings uh, us to the next uh, stage of um, of the event i'm very pleased to see here marius tudor uh, from the european parliament side he is a senior advisor on non-discrimination and romani policies and uh, it is my pleasure to invite him to uh, make uh, his concluding remarks marius you have the floor Thank you very much, dear Zoltan. It is a huge pleasure to see you again. And um, before getting to my conclusions about this meeting, I would like to ask all members of the European Public Health Alliance, but also those members of the Romani Health Network to accept my gratitude for all of their hard work and for the support that they have shown in the times when I was by you. Thank you so much. 
and you know some parts of the success that I'm enjoying now it's also because of you thank you now getting back to my uh, conclusions I would like um, to speak now not from the position of uh, a senior advisor on uh, non-discrimination and Roma policies in the office of uh, Mr. Franz, but as a simple Roma. You all know that all that I did and all that I'm doing is actually by thinking first to those people from the ground. This is uh, actually something very strong that connects me and Mr. Franz. I am a Roma. Mr. Franz is a Sinto. We are Romani people. And I was so happy to hear some of you using this new terminology, which is also asked in the resolution, Romani people, because this shows very well our diversity. I would like to focus a bit on the, on the solution, on the major source of hope for our people. In the end, the major source of hope for our people is of course in the hands of our Romani people, but they must be enabled first. And I think the resolution that was adopted by the parliament on 17th of October, uh, September, gives them this power to enable themselves to make the change they want to achieve. However, the parliament did the first step, a very courageous one. Many are saying it's an historical one because in the history of more than 60 years of this parliament, it is for the first time when an MEP here, Mr. Franz had the courage to develop a resolution and ask for a Romani law. Now, it is the time for the Commission to be more ambitious and to be more courageous, to not be afraid about the fact that they will fail, because fail means first attempt <laughs> in learning. So, Putting on the table of the parliament and the council a legislative text could be the most courageous step towards Romani equality, inclusion and participation that the commission might take. The argument is the following. Now the chances are bigger. Why? Because article 19 of the treaty, paragraph two, says that the parliament has 50% power on the adoption of a potential directive. So it's not only unanimity in the council. Uh, being afraid that we are going to lose more than 10 years waiting for this to happen, it is an argument, but it is not a strong and valid argument from my point of view, because if you will go right now in a Romani community marginalized, when you will see children starving, going to bed hungry and they will ask you what are you doing there for me i'm wondering what is the answer so instead of being afraid i suggest we take some risks as we did in the parliament nobody believed a resolution asking for a law would have been possible absolutely nobody it was only mr franz and myself and in the end 545 other members. So at around 80% of this parliament is behind this resolution. And I think this is a strong enough political message from the highest political institution in the EU to at least make the commission understand that they can take some risks. Doesn't matter if other minorities are coming to them asking for a directive for themselves too. It's okay. We cannot solve specific issues with general solutions. We need specific targeted measures for specific issues, but without making them exclusive. So I am thankful to all of you because you have managed to put together a group of people sharing a common purpose, common interest with different skills and knowledge that are ready to build the power they need to make the change they want. And I hope this will not stay only at the level of the rhetoric. And how I know the people from IFA, I know this is not going to happen. 
I know a lot of actions is going to come. Dear Rados, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Marius. Before closing this event, I would like to address some of the questions raised by the participants, especially the questions concerning Roma participation. We know that inequalities between Roma and non-Roma have different dimensions, and they also affect Roma participation. We know that beyond the purely social and economic reasons, there is a strong human rights aspect leading to lower social and political participation of Roma. This is an issue deserving a special attention from policymakers in the design and implementation of post-2020 national Roma inclusion, equality, and participation strategies. Roma should be provided with equal opportunities to repair the damage caused by social exclusion to break the cycle of poverty and inequalities, but also to play a better role in the decision-making process in the next programming period. With the COVID-19 pandemic, we witnessed an increase of health inequalities, and it has a greater impact on vulnerable groups, including Roma. The breakdown in social inclusion, cohesion, and the rise of inequalities jeopardized the little progress achieved in social justice and health equity across Europe. These issues raise the need for strong cooperation and coordinated actions involving all relevant stakeholders, including Roma and pro-Roma civil society actors, but also Roma communities themselves. This is a vital factor for building a solid system that will successfully meet the needs of the most vulnerable and strengthen their protection in case of further public health, social, and economic crisis. Inequalities in health coverage, affordability of health protection do not affect only individuals and communities. They affect society and economy as a whole. The United Nations Agenda for Sustainable Development underlines the importance of addressing social and economic protection in parallel with healthcare and prevention. This is much more relevant for Roma communities who experience poor health, but also they are greatly vulnerable to unemployment, generational and child poverty and social exclusion, increasing further the gap between Roma and the majority. Reducing health inequalities becomes an imperative an imperative having a social, economic, and demographic aspect. Therefore, policy measures tackling holistically health inequalities are indispensable for achieving positive and sustainable results on Roma equality, inclusion, and participation. Such measures will contribute to promote social justice and health equity across Europe but also support Europe's recovery and resilience. The potential of 12 million Roma living in Europe and their capacities to contribute to Europe's social, economic, and economic development should not be ignored, especially now when the European Commission recovery plan aims to shape the Europe for next generation. This Europe should not leave Roma behind. Roma should have equal opportunities to participate in policy design, implementation, and policy monitoring. And such measures will provide effective policy solutions to tackle health inequalities that Roma face today, but also to close the gap between the Roma and the majority. Now, I would like to thank NEP Romeo France, the European Commission, DG Justice, and Roma Coordination Unit in particular, our panelists, and the Roma Health Network members for their great commitment to address health inequalities that Roma face across Europe. Also, I would like to thank our audience for their participation, for their questions, and look forward to continue the discussion on social media. Thank you very much.